Okay, people. Okay, everybody. So, the following pictures and documents on this video are real. It is disturbing. I did tell y'all I was going to show this video about people a long, long, long time ago, apparently before the fallen ones. Well, apparently, there's been all types of followers that came here, and it seems to be the bugs who I understand the ones that is from a different dimension are very aggressive towards people, and they're more like a um, praying mantis. But you actually have seen these type of pictures on caves, well not caves, on pyramids as the depiction to the right of, you know, you can see it to the, well it looks like it's to the right of me, but, so yeah, so you can kind of see that. Now when I play this video, you're going to, I would pay a lot of attention to see if I can get it bigger for y'all. And like I said. Yeah, apparently, people a long time ago before the Anunnaki came here, there were, or actually, time out, I got to correct that. Maybe, it, I should say, because actually the Anunnaki must have been here at the time. And one Anunnaki must have been a bug people, some type of bug, of all types of kind of bug people. Um, one kind of. And the reason I say that is because they're on the pyramids, and those roots feeding them and serving them, like praising them as if they was us when they're not. And it's the outside nations doing it. You got these Hamites doing it and white folks doing it. So far, so far they have not seen our people doing it in any of these videos. But it's very scary because these things seem to take over their mind, some type of mind control. And then they see, they seem to make the they human become one with them like literally physically and not just mentally but physically they become you you'll see watch the video please don't watch the following pictures and documents were retrieved from the remains of the ship storaker its crew and most of its cargo lost in a storm off the coast of denmark while returning from an archaeology expedition to the viking burial ground of sondrum excerpt from the diary of maine archaeologist tor j arn 22nd of March, 1905. Today, we dug up something strange. It wasn't far from the other graves in the area, but it was buried deeper. The extraction was difficult, since it had become encased in a hard piece of sandstone we had to break through. This artifact, it doesn't look like anything we've seen from the Vikings. It seems too detailed for one of their carvings, and the dark stone it's made out of is certainly not from the region. A piece of loot from one of their raids, perhaps? We'll have to bring it back to Copenhagen and analyze it further. The crew is quite disturbed by the artifact, and I've heard far-fetched speculation about its origins. As much as I hate to admit, it makes me feel uneasy too. There's one more thing I'm hesitating to write down. When I touched its surface, I felt a slight vibration, nearly imperceptible. None of the others seemed to notice. Thinking back on it, that was likely the result of a tired mind and an imagination stirred by old wives' tales. Tomorrow we'll load it up on the ship with the rest of the findings and come back to the museum. May, 1909, Brisbane, Australia. Fisherman Adam James Clark makes an unusual catch. He would keep the object in his home, fascinated by it, until his disappearance six months later. Adam was a dutiful diarist. In his notes, we can see the slow progression of his mental state and his deepening obsession with the cocoon. May 14th, 1909. The strangest thing got tangled in my net today. I have no idea what it is, but I managed to pull it to shore. I think it may be a live egg or a cocoon of some sea animal. If I put my hand to it, I can feel it twitch a little. Seems to survive well enough out of the water, for now. Wonder if something will come out of it. A photographer was at the jetty, and I got back and got me some pictures of the thing. We'll be here to keep some record if it ends up rotting away. The husk takes up a great deal of space in my room, but that beats empty. It's a good listener. Though, not too fond of conversation, it seems. I've been waiting so long for him to come out. Sometimes I put my ear to the shell and listen to him moving there, metamorphosing. I read that during the cocoon phase, insects melt into some sort of liquid inside, 
and then rebuild themselves into something new. Whatever he looks like, I can't wait to welcome him into this world. I wonder if he'll see me as a father. Sometimes I'm afraid to leave the room and fear that the husk that traps him may open while I'm not here. I hope the grandkids haven't missed me. This last diary entry is dated November 3rd of that year. Adam was never seen again. November 3rd. He nearly doesn't move anymore. Is he dead? He needs something to finish his metamorphosis. I think he needs me. He needs me. I must enter. I must unite with him. Give his body structure. He is Adam Clark. I am him. Bound by a husk. Prison of flesh and chitin. I will bring him to where I found him. Pry his shell open. Climb inside and jump into the water as we become one. We will finally complete his beautiful transformation. He. We. Will be free. Weeks later, a fishing boat would discover what appears to be the remains of the shell, broken and completely empty. 1910, Northport, Maine. An unidentified carcass washes up on shore. Local newspapers report, strange shell washes ashore. Residents from Northport reported a strange animal washing up ashore this morning. Tis a honking lobster. I, uh, we thought it was a whale at first, said Eugene Morrell, local fisherman. We were going to boil it, but taint no meat inside. The carcass was left on the docks, so a biologist from Maine University could identify it. Tragedy in Northport. Friday morning, the body of Jimmy Hall, 12-year-old boy from Northport, was found lying on the docks. The child appears to have slipped and fallen on his head while sneaking out at night to see an unidentified carcass that had washed up on shore. The town's fishermen who had discovered the animal claimed it carried a curse and took it upon themselves to destroy the remains of the lobster-like shell by burning it, much to the chagrin of two Maine University biologists who had come to inspect it. Honored pictures from the Australasian Antarctic Expedition, year 1913. Something strange is found in the ice. Cecil Madigan's diary on the subject, 17th January, 1913. The slaying party was a total success. We mapped a large area east of the base, but the most fascinating finding was what appears to be an enormous larva, as big as a man. I am no biologist. McLean keeps saying it'll be the discovery of the century. The insect was perfectly preserved in the ice, so we sawed around it and brought back the whole block. The whole team had a toast of the discovery. Due to Mawson's team's unfortunate journey, a small group was left in Antarctica for a whole year more than expected. 9th of February. 1913. It is starting to dawn on me that we are staying for more than one year. Mawson came back and told us of his tragic journey. We will miss Ninnis and Metz, but no use wallowing. The ship has sailed. This year, I will assist McLean in studying the insect. The crew has taken to calling her Margot after Maggot. We will not break the ice as the body might be fragile. Jeffries, the new arrival, has taken a lot of interest in the bug and keeps coming to see it. Asking all sorts of questions, he could become an annoyance. Excerpts from Sidney, Jeffries, and Madigan's diaries from the incident that led to the loss of the specimen in the winter of 1913. Jeffries would never recover his sanity after the expedition. 2nd of August, 1913. He broke it. That madman, Jeffries completely lost his block, went to the storage room in the middle of the night and took an axe to Margot. He minced her so thin we couldn't recover a single piece of her. Still this work, and we will not be able to bring a thing back to Australia. We found Jeffries outside, repeating that he had freed her over and over. We locked him in, since he's become a danger to the mission. Last surviving photographs from the secretive De La Cruz family, Mexico, 1910 to 1920s. The following documents were smuggled out by Adrian De La Cruz, a disowned relative. According to him, the thing in the photo is who the family called Tio Alfredo. The De La Cruz were local landowners. They lived in an isolated estate in Morelos for generations, surrounded by croplands and pastures. They were rarely seen outside, leading locals to circulate many rumors about the family and their sickly disposition. Adrian De La Cruz was the only household member known to have escaped. After fighting in the revolution, he chose not to come back and left to Mexico City, where he studied chemistry and met his wife, Cristina. The pictures were retrieved by him, sent with the following letter. Christina, I am sorry for leaving without a word. I came back to my family home. Something was left undone. You will not believe this, so I, I put some photos in this envelope. This thing, Tio Alfredo, it has always been there, in the attic. I gave it my blood. We all did. 
I don't know how long it has been with us, since the time of my great-grandfathers, or more. And for this long, everyone has been convinced that it is a part of the family. Maybe it used to be, but none of that matters. I need to break this cycle and save them from this torture. I have brought a vial of cyanide. I will drink it, then go into the attic and let the beast feed on me, just like it used to. That horrible, empty sensation. If all goes well, I will then drink my antidote and come back to you, having rid the world of this devil. Adrian, we have not been able to find any more documentation on the incident, except for a photo, dated to around the same time as the letter taken in the cemetery near the De La Cruz estate, Italy, 1917. An art collector finds three unusual statues in a small museum in Aquila. They appear to represent angels with insect wings, pincers, and extra sets of limbs. Entranced by them, he would acquire the sculptures for his personal collection. To find out more about them, he contacted Francis Aidan Gasquet, archivist in the Vatican. They found a codex from 15th century Spain. It was commissioned by Antonio Perez de Ayala, a nobleman's son turned monk. It describes his spiritual experience after finding an angel. The angel was said to come from a cocoon found in the sea. It was likely worshipped in Ayala's monastery, as proved by the surviving works of art. We do not know what happened, only a letter that was found in which the Vatican asks for a local noble to help destroy a heresy. The art collector never released the statues from his personal collection, so the old pictures are all the proof we have of their existence. You open the old binder. Inside, some pictures, torn pages, and a letter. Let me tell you of the time I saw one of the Megalomorpha. You heard this story before, but these documents should help clear your skepticism. It was 1923, and I was traveling through British Tanganyika. After finishing my studies in anthropology at the age of 24, I was eager to go out and document unknown cultures. During that trip is when I met the Jammu people, a wonderful and rich society with barely any interaction with the outside world. During my three weeks with them, I observed their peculiar customs, particularly the constant motif of stag beetles, apparent from their clothes to their buildings and weapons. I first thought it was expert craftsmanship, but I now suspect the objects came from a different source. Jammu culture is very different from that of the surrounding tribes. They show a mix of hunter-gatherer and agricultural traits, and do not seem to have a clear social structure. Their art and religion are unlike anything I have seen. Stories are passed down from the elders to the young. Many of them are centered around the figure of Kenya, depicted in statues as a hybrid of a man and stag beetle. Communication was quite difficult due to the uniqueness of their language, which the translator was not able to fully grasp. I am not proud of having followed them in secret, but if it were not for that, I would not have seen the insect. At first, I thought they were hunting it, but then I realized their interaction looked more like a conversation. They followed a flock of birds to a clearing, where they stopped and chanted in unison. I got closer to take a photograph, but I was seen and had to leave expeditiously. Unfortunately, after this incident, I was not welcome in the village anymore, so I had to resume my journey. As you know, trying to publish this information only led to ridicule and me being cast out from academia. That is why I spent my life trying to prove their existence. Thank you again for your help, friend. I cannot do this alone at my age. Sincerely, Nigel Buckley. 1927, the Turner Bros. Circus begins touring the USA with an unusual exhibit. Their publicity claims it is an Amazonian mammoth ant, though no such species has been described. For two years, they would tour the Midwest, attracting the curious and skeptics. Very little documentation remains apart from the posters and two photographs. The man who appears in the picture and poster is Henry Turner, one of the two founders of the circus. In later recollections from his brother Robert, he claimed Henry became obsessed with the ant. Towards the end, he was even sleeping in the cage with it. One day he just took off with the ant, left everything behind. Henry would not be heard from again. The loss of the founder and the stock market crash of 1929 was too much for the circus, which closed that year. Norway, 1953. Erling Jorgensen, a local journalist, visits the isolated parish of Ernis, accused by many of being a cult. His unpublished notes and photographs are the only remaining source on this group and the events that culminated in its destruction. The small parish was based around a modern church. 
Though initially unremarkable, starting around 1947, the community would take an isolationist turn. Parishioners started shunning external contact, except for the occasional missionary sent to recruit people into the group. In August 1953, journalist Erling Jorgensen was allowed to visit the community, take pictures, and interview their members. Though Erling was given relatively free reign, he was not allowed to enter the church during sermon hours, at which time he was put under watch. The community was headed by Torhagen, often just described as the bishop, and his three sons. The self-proclaimed bishop and his entourage had essentially broken contact with the Church of Norway, forming their own hierarchy. The priests wore masks as part of their vestments. Many of the particular rituals of this group were centered around their youngest members. They wore white clothing and were referred to as initiates. The purpose of their initiation was never made clear. In an interview, a seven-year-old claims, One day, I will be one with God. According to Erling's notes, on the day of his departure, he was taken over by curiosity. Instead of leaving, he snuck into the church and hid there, waiting for the sermon he had not been allowed to watch. As it started, he saw an immense creature appear from behind the altar. The church has been silent for hours as that thing pulsates on the wall. I need to do something. Erling's unpublished notes end there. A fire destroyed the church that day. Erling never admitted to having been there. After his death, it was revealed that he had lit the match. Leaked report from the USSR Committee of State Security, KGB, 1961. Full report and translation below. In June 1961, a group of Navy personnel carried out a survey on sunken merchant ships in the Kara Sea, taken down during the Second World War by the Germans. The divers carried underwater cameras with them to document the state of the boats. Upon investigating the survey ship, academic Shokalshish, sunken by a U-boat in 1943, the diver came upon the nest of some sort of creature resembling an insect of enormous size. Analysis has determined it to be an unknown species, and was given the provisional name of Vivishkova. The details are unclear, as only the camera was recovered, and the rest of the crew deemed the waters unsafe to investigate further. The pictures were taken back to KGB headquarters for analysis and deliberation. We have determined these documents to be of national security interest, and thus will be kept with utmost discretion. The rest of the diving crew has already been dealt with appropriately. Our next aim should be to recover the eggs shown in the pictures. A team will be discreetly assembled to deal with Vivishkova and bring back as many eggs as possible for the study. Scientists are also being gathered in attempts to train the animals as they are born. All of this will take place in our base in Dixon. The aim is to use them on enemy ships in response to American aggression, to neutralize them without leaving a trace of our actions. This could take a toll on their forces without linking back to us. Further developments will be communicated through private channels to the parties involved. Communicated for your information. Signed, Chairman of the Committee, A. Shelobin. 21st of August, 1982. A report on a local TV channel in Sicily. A Roman ruin has been found last Monday when building a hotel near Modica. Archaeologists are asking for more time to study the elaborate mosaic, but are under pressure from the owners who want the building done before July. This beautifully preserved mosaic has puzzled historians. Among rich hunting scenes, what looks to be an enormous wasp appears to be eating an antelope. This piece stands out from the other realistic scenes, and does not seem to match any known Roman myths. The photo above was recovered by the daughter of the late head archaeologist, Piero Baglieri. No other sources on the mosaic can be publicly found, nor information about the hotel that was built on top. Among the documents Nigel Buckley sent in 1984, you find his notes and illustrations. What can we glean from the new sightings we have documented of these creatures? They clearly appear to be related to insects, only at a much larger scale. Are they a part of the same species, or perhaps a broader genus or family? Provisionally, I have decided to treat them as a single genus, which I call Megalomorpha. I cannot say if the myriad forms we see are due to extreme individual variability, or if several species exist. What makes me lean towards the single species variability hypothesis is the shell found in Maine. These molts are more common in insects going through partial metamorphosis, which suggests megalomorphae may be capable of radical changes in form later in life. Nigel had spent all of his life studying these insects since he reportedly found one in Tanganyika in 1923. He passed away in 1986, not being able to complete his life work of redeeming his image in the scientific community. Most of the evidence you've seen so far is his work. Pictures found in an abandoned, remotely operated vehicle, 2004. It was recovered from the seafloor, damaged, and with its umbilical cord cut off. 
three years after being lost during the survey of the sunken ship Ihim Maru. The vehicle was found during a seafloor survey by the Polynesian Oil and Gas Company. They were attempting to build an oil pipeline in Hawaii. The company closed in 2014, but an ex-employee managed to hold on to these documents. The note reads as follows. As some of you know, during the seafloor survey done between Honolulu and Molokai for the Hawaii Pipeline Project, an abandoned remotely operated vehicle was found on the ocean floor. We believe it was used to survey the Ihim Maru, a Japanese fishing boat sunk after an accident with the submarine USS Greenville in 2001. The ROV was probably lost during the survey, as we found the umbilical cord severed and signs of damage. The body of the vehicle was lifted, and some data recovered from it. Among it, some pictures were found. These were, to our knowledge, not obtained by the Navy. The CEO wishes to inform you that this matter will be resolved internally, as to not cause a delay in the pipeline project that may make it go over budget. We urge all employees to handle this matter with discretion, and not share this information with external sources, as it may trigger an unnecessary environmental inquiry that could damage the company. Last of all, as we reach the last stretch of this project, we want to congratulate you for all your efforts. It is thanks to each one of our valued employees that we have managed to come this far, and we are confident that with your help, we will keep reaching new heights. Strange trail cam pictures were recovered from a now defunct hunting forum, October 2006. These screenshots were saved at the time by a user, but no archived version remains. The original poster could not be tracked down. Any new information on this subject would be greatly appreciated. So, I'm a bit spooked. Set up a couple trail cams yesterday, and when I looked at them today, I saw these two pics. Can anyone help me identify what this is? This was in Overton County, Tennessee, by the way. You think I could have discovered something new? <laughs> Lol, I have trouble believing this. Don't you think a huge insect like that would have been seen before? Either it's a weird camera trick where the bug is actually close, or you're full of it, friend. Wow, okay. No need to be rude, Moose. I don't think there's a camera trick here. You can see there's trees in front of it, so it's not just the bug that got close. There's lots of unexplained animals that science hasn't studied yet, so that's a very closed-minded way of seeing things. I have no idea how to use Photoshop either, if that's what you imply. I don't even think it's possible to fake something like this. Anyway, if there's anyone willing to actually help out, please just let me know. Well, I guess I'm not sleeping tonight. Justin, I'm no photography expert, but this sounds like something that would happen with old cameras. Sometimes they would shoot twice in the same film. That's why people would see ghosts sometimes. Maybe something like this happened here and two pictures got mixed up. One of the bugs up close and a normal one. Seems more likely than a giant bug flying out there. Occam Razor and all that. I can understand it's an error, but the odds of that happening twice seems unlikely. The cameras worked well otherwise. Do you folks have any other theories? Or if it's a normal bug? Can anyone identify? Bump? 2011. A cave with Neolithic paintings and artifacts is... Uh, hold on, y'all. Hold the press, hold the press. So I just had an epiphany. So you know, we remember, we remember everything. Everything comes back to us. And this is crazy. Because like, okay, now we know when they kept on saying Mr. J, we know they was trying to get us to serve their dead daddy. We know they was using the devil's name. But the trick was that you were. Now, you're not the daddy and all this stuff. But it's no, you were the sacrifice. You were actually the ultimate sacrifice. That don't work no more. It don't work no more. So no matter what they do now, nothing, nothing works. Or anything they want to do. It did work at one point, unfortunately. But, listen, right? There's also a scripture where it says that Mr. J went down to the pit of hell. Mr. J held the key. Now, we both know now we, how they had twisted it and told the devil had the key and that he was the, you know, they tried to make him seem like he's the most high when he's not. But they was trying to play the good and bad side like they do. And then they freaking said that Mr. J went down. You know, we know the bullshit. We know all the bullshit, hijack bullshit. But here's the thing, right? We have many mansions. We created everything. And everything is in us. We're all only one anyway. We're everywhere but nowhere. 
Because atoms are liquid, not solid. Although your body appears as solid, it's made up of atoms, but your body is really just liquid. But the atom is not really real. But it seems real, but it's not. But it feels real, but it ain't. Right? But this is what we created, an atom. Atom forms things to appear solid, although a liquid, which means that they're not really there. So, we have all these different planets, all these galaxies, all these dimensions, all these mansions, and all this stuff we created, and all that is in us. So now that brings up two things. One, is everything is in us, does this mean that actually deep in the ether, that we're actually going through a phase of where we're trying to get rid of all the things that is in us that is no good? And these things that is around us are actually a bad part of remembering that we're trying to get rid of and are getting rid of because we made everything. And all those things that we made, made other things that were evil, it cannot exist unless we had allowed it to. Because we got curious. Curious George, have I told you about that? Okay. So, it is that the case. Does this also mean that all our places that we made come from, from, from to mansions, to districts, to planets, to galaxies, to all this stuff, all this stuff, all this stuff we've made as far as places to go visit in the dream state worlds because then again, this is not real. We're not even here, right? Okay, I had to breathe so I closed my mouth so I could breathe through my nose first. I was talking for a while. Why did that just do that? So, and that means every place was supposed to be a heaven. But we do know that all of these demons went all over the place to and fro, doing whatever they please. They was destroying and tearing up planets, making AI, which destroys worlds and kills planets or messes them up. Um, they were sitting up there invading places, raping and pillaging people, making new things that had no business existing. Right? So that means if, if Earth and all it was is actually called, it's not called Earth, but I'll get to that in a minute. Is that it, 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 Earth and all places was actually a heaven, would that, and all, that and they, these things went all over the place and did this stuff, messed everything up but of course it's all getting fixed now right so so now if that is the case and earth was also a heaven could this mean that they have already in the past and in the future. Well, not no, not the future. They're done in the future. They can't do shit in the future. They're finished. Like they're done. But I mean, in the past and up to this point, which is now about to be, they're about to be so done, right? That this whole time they've been raiding this planet. They invaded a long time ago and they never stopped going, going, coming to and fro to this place of gradually making it a hell. Right? For us. Because think about it. Earth is called Key. Planet Key. Not Planet Kai. Key as K-E-Y. Key as a key to your house. Key. Planet Key. Not Kai. Not after a dragon. That's a trick. It's a hijack. That's why I keep saying y'all start teaching and then y'all don't dig deep to find out what this place is really called. Yeah, at one point it was called Total Island. It was named, many freaking names were all the wrong names. This is actually Planet Key. 
of the 999 duality. That's why your number is 999, because that is the structure of which you have made of it. It tells you that in which you are. You are 999. That's your number. 666 is for atoms. Remember, of these things, right? Because you have to remember that half of you, you can actually mix an atom with other properties and get other things as we already have outside nations and then put a drop of blood in it. I shouldn't be telling you this, but anyways, just know that these motherfucking demons, because that's something just straight call them, they did this. These demons, they did this. So just know this. So if they did this, and we have these people, outside nations, which are not us, which are not us, then something had to use some of these atoms and mix gene splicing, different things with them, like monkeys. I got the video on that too. Um, just keep being real, y'all. No, I'm never throwing anything I ain't got no proof about. Or I haven't talked before and showed y'all evidence about before. Um, and they made these things. They call them humans. We're not humans. We're 999 ether light beings. You don't have to say 9 ether light beings. But wouldn't that mean that if you made everything, including the earth, that you made? The earth and the earth is actually planet key. The key to everything is the key to other realities, dualities, even bad ones, which would be a way to get bad things here if they wanted to, if they could somehow get on the key and change the vibration of the key. Follow me. And since that happened, all these bad things happened. But now it is in a high, positive, very good, nine ether, nine 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 ether, and our ether, which is all us combined. The ether out there, which is part of us. In fact, it is us because we are all one. But it's all about, if you don't understand this, you do not exist anymore. It is all about the collective. And we are the collective. Now, since we're changing the vibration of this planet, it's key to positive vibrations and have done so. Everything's heating up. Just the way we like it. And things we purify, including the key. And that's why these beings and these outside nations and their pappies, demon devils, fallen ones, all those bad things are really freaking out. The food and the water is about to go. A planet only habitable enough for a light being who can literally live off the sun, but they can't do that. So what's that mean for them? Extinction levels, getting rid of the virus. So I just came to me and it's like, man, this is crazy. And... This would mean that these giant bugs would have had it came because all of them came from places and a lot of them got stuck here. Came from a whole nother district, invaded so they could land on the key, so they could try to change the vibration of the key. Or by the time they got here, maybe it was already changed because somebody else had came and changed the key because many of them kept coming one after another and making new beings one after another. And now the funny thing is now, if you actually think about this too, 
these bugs that are stuck on the planet Key, right, who are now obviously ter ter terrified, just like all the fallen ones are terrified of this high vibration that we are having. Would it mean that these giant bugs that are stuck down here, which are obviously demon bugs, the fallen demon bugs, or what's what, what's angels and now just demons, are uh, stuck down here, and maybe they created stuff. Maybe that's why you have the praying mantis alien that flies in spaceships and that then really and really are very aggressive towards humans, and probably would be try would try to be aggressive towards us. Hybrid bug. So they 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 can't now they stuck in this point where they can't create anymore. So now they need a human. Because they haven't used nuts. They've been using these humans. Some are brown, then they not us. Some are white and of nationalities, and they not us. And they somehow merge their DNA with them to become a bug man, bug woman. Think about that, man. It just dawned on me. Things come to my head so crazy sometimes. It's just sporadic. It's kind of chaotic because it comes one after another. Found near Tedic, Spain. Among the buried remains is an adult cranium with unknown malformations. The cave art appears to have religious significance. The first scene represents people fighting and escaping what appears to be a large insect-like form with six limbs and large horns. Below, people are kneeling before a similar figure in a more solemn pose. They make offerings to it. The following part has been purposefully chiseled off, leaving few recognizable traces. The final scene shows more people kneeling and laying their weapons below what looks like their deities, which show elements of both humans and the previous six-limbed creature. No other gods of such description are known in the area. Care instructions for my Gatsby. My gazpacho. Mr. Henry Chicken. Mr. D and the previous six-limbed creature. No other gods of such description are known in the area. Holy bug fucking shit! Some sort of tree of life of massive mind-controlling insects that has gone mostly undetected for the majority of history, other than isolated incidents of their documentation. I wonder if this is at all related to the giant cocoon that I keep in my closet and constantly pray to. Probably not, though. Wow. Let's break down what we know. These large insectoid creatures have been sparingly documented throughout history. Spanning from 1905 to the current day, depictions and evidence of these creatures have been leaked into the public light. Despite this, the megalomorpha has still not been acknowledged officially by the scientific community. <clears throat> Sci scientific community. These creatures are either discovered as a cocoon or documented later on as various different fully grown insectoid critters. There are either many species of megalomorpha that always go through metamorphosis, or they have incredible variability in what the other side of that metamorphosis might end up looking like. Not only do the megalomorpha go through an intense metamorphosis process, changing their bodies to a myriad of forms, but it appears that the final stage of the megalomorpha lifestyle involves fusing with a human for some reason. And this can be seen in the man bug monster, the myth, the legend, T.O. Alfredo, which translates incorrectly to English as Uncle Creamy Pasta. Tio Alfredo was a megalomorpha that worked his way up the corporate ladder by fusing with what I assume was once the real Tio Alfredo. Evidently, Uncle Bug had been with the family since the time of the narrator's great-grandfather and had convinced them that it was a part of the family. I think Tio Alfredo is deserving enough of love that he shouldn't have to convince them of anything. All he wanted was your love and bodily fluid. Isn't that what we all want? Even though this looks like a clusterfuck of random bug family information, combined with some research from another video, this may illustrate what exactly the hell these creatures are. One way we can potentially further understand what the megalomorpha are is by not stealing the information directly from someone else's video. Speaking of, Valdez Evia actually answered a bit of the question of what the hell these bugs are in a curious archive video. So I'm gonna not steal that. The megalomorpha they can kind of make themselves appear to the people around them as kind of whatever they interpret. And it's based on their previous beliefs. What their background is, they may think it's some sort of deity. It appears that the megalomorpha manipulates the human mind and manufactures a reality in which the humans love and care for the insects. It becomes their baby, their god, their Tio, whatever they need to be to gain the adoration of the hairless apes in question. 
From there, it somehow convinces one person to fuse with them, allowing them to change into their final form. Why it needs humans to complete its life cycle is still a mystery. And I'm not sure if these bugs count as a parasite, or if the combo in question is a new animal in its own right. Whatever the case, we can see from the documentation leaks that these creatures have been with us since the days of the Romans, the Vikings, the cavemen, and continue to be with us in the, the days of online hunting forums, I, I guess. I want to see megalomorpha porn. No, I don't. Since before humanity could Fuck. write things down, these creatures have been here, infiltrating select pockets of the human species and controlling their Previous. minds for unknown, possibly nefarious purposes. Before we had our technology, our language, our society, we served only these insects. Who knows? Maybe they control our numbers in a much greater ratio than we think. Maybe we're just a giant, busy ant colony. And under the surface, everything we do is in service of our one massive pulsating queen. Oh god, I'm gonna come! One theory I have is that the megalomorpha themselves are the reason they haven't been discovered yet. Think about it. If you were a giant mind controlling insect, would you want the little weird. Uh, you gotta excuse a little stuff that he has some of these characters saying, like the one that just said something stupid. So I don't know why he did that, but anyhow. Fearless apes that you're controlling to know enough about your existence to be capable of forming an opinion about what you're doing? Because I wouldn't. I would mind control the apes into thinking it's not a problem because I'm not real. One giant question I have about these mind manipulating buggies is, what the hell do they want? Chances are that the megalomorpha just wants what we all want. A bigger dick to live. It's likely that this is just the evolutionary strategy that these creatures have always known. They stayed close to humans and brainwashed the apes to care for them because it worked as a survival strategy. Just that? like that cats. Fuck, By controlling the little wrinkles in their head meatballs, the insects yeah, could ensure not only that they'd survive, this. but in fact live comfortably off the hard work of humanity. It's also possible that these creatures aren't just big brainwashing bugs and do have some sort of ulterior motive. But in true unknowable horror fashion, what exactly that motive would be is impossible to gauge. Moving on from what is literally happening in these documentations. Simple. To feed, to live off of people, to take your body fluids and live off your body eventually. And seize or merge themselves with you so they can become something higher because you are and they cannot achieve that on their own. They've been detached from the life force. However, what they come into is gruesome because they're not supposed to make that uh, geno with DEA. Because DNA has no business being around DEA. Okay? And that's a good reason, but that would be called gene splicing, okay? Because no matter how hard I try, I'm going to be too stupid to figure this out in the entirety. The story of Megalomorpha is... Or you can take DNA and mix it with a damn ape or something else, and whatever, and, whatever, and do a bunch of other different type of animals all together and get people. Quite thematically rich as well. One clear theme of this Gene's story price. is metamorphosis. Not only is it the literal life cycle of the massive bug critters in question, but the theme of change is present throughout the timeline, especially in the longer and later entries. Individuals, families, even large communities can be transformed under their influence. One can see this clearly in the fisherman's obsession, the prehistoric people going from hunting the insects to worshipping and finally becoming one with them, and even in Adrian de la Cruz's escape from the cycle. In the end, both humanity and megalomorpha come together and change into something new, something grander than both of them separately. One may wonder about the inspiration behind this story. Evia states that he was inspired by Lovecraft's storytelling methods, in which he told his stories through found documents that only had little traces of evidence throughout the years. It was also inspired by real-life historical accounts of expeditions. The combination of these two makes sense to me, because the only person who's going to be more vague than Lovecraft is the guy who's literally paid to write all that shit down. Do you have any theories about the Megalomorpha? If you should, you should comment below and I'll tell you why you're wrong. I'm smarter than you. This video was based on the art collection titled Megalomorpha by Eduardo Valdez Evia. They're an awesome. So there you go. You can buy that book by Eduardo Valdez Evia. Whatever how you just want to say his name. It's right there in writing. But anyways, yeah. Uh huh. Right. Right. Wow. Peace and love, y'all. <laughs> Shit's crazy.